um, be sure and look at these. These will tell you the lectures that are coming up, the presentations that are coming up night after night, and that will be important. Also, many of you don't know, all next week, this coming next week is on archaeology, which is fascinating to all of us, but Tony Moore is going to be with us all the next week, and he's going to be giving a presentation entitled Tracing the Footsteps of Jesus, which is one of his most popular, popular lectureship series. I've enjoyed so much getting to know Tony Moore since it was worked out for us to get him here. For 25 years, he pastored churches, but he has had a burning desire to find, through the secrets of archaeology, proof and uh, of the Bible and of the history of God's working through uh, the history of mankind. And archaeology proves that very much. And he started going out on his own, working, trying to find these secrets, and you will enjoy those tonight. There's a lot of things that he has up here. After the uh, service this evening, you're welcome to come up and look at them. Uh, I do want to tell you that these are not souvenirs, though, okay? I want you to know that uh, right off, but he has some fascinating other details that he can give you. Well, I'd like to invite you uh, to bow your heads. We want to have a word of prayer. And then we will turn the time over to Tony Moore. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for giving us evidence to put our faith on. I pray that you will bless tonight, this evening. I pray that you'll anoint Tony. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Make sure I turn that on. How are you this evening? It's nice to be here in the land of green. I live in the grand of, land of brown. It's brown in my house now. And so when we walk in our woods on our trails, it's all nice and brown and so wonderful to see the green. You know, when you live in California, you forget how many shades of green there are. And, uh, but you know, I can just tell you one thing about living in California. When it's all brown here, it's gonna be green at my house this winter. <laughs> But anyway, it's wonderful to be back in the South. One thing I forget about, too, is uh, that, that H word. You know, I, I grew up in, was born in Florida and grew up in North Carolina. And I remember meeting uh, the first people I, I recall ever meeting from California. And all they could do was complain about the humidity. Oh, it's so humid here. What's humidity? I didn't know any difference, right? Growing up in the South and uh, got off that plane last night and I thought, wow, it's humid. And walked out today and I thought, wow, it's humid. <laughs> I thought, my wife said, I uh, hope you brought that, uh, oh, no, I won't say that, that underarm stuff, but anyway. So anyway, it's great to be here in the South and uh, to be back in this part of the world and to be able to share with you. Here, let me move the, I'll move these things for you. Yeah, no problem, no, no. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, it's great to be here with you, and as Pastor Fred mentioned, we have, um, a lovely week of uh, materials to share with you. Tomorrow evening, what's it called? Fabulous Tales, the Tell Tells, right? Can you say that very fast? Fabulous Tales, the Tell Tells. So we'll be looking at, uh, we'll go to a wonderful place called uh, Petra. Anybody been to Petra? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we'll be going to Petra and we'll tell that fascinating story not a lot to do with the Bible there, some interesting things, and we'll look at that. But we're going to look at how archaeology works, fabulous tales that tell tales. And then on Sunday, we don't have a meeting, but on Monday, instead of watching Monday Night Football, unless you come to the 4.30 meeting, you can come to my favorite city, the Jew, the Arab, and Jerusalem. Really, we should say the Jew, the Christian, the Muslim in Jerusalem, because the Christians in Jerusalem are called Arabs because they speak Arabic, okay? And so it's really the Jew, the Arab, the Jew, the Christian, the Muslim in Jerusalem. And then we have uh, Wednesday, Tuesday, what, what day does that take us to? That takes us to Monday. Tuesday, we're going to uh, look at uh, the setting um, 
of the world into which Jesus was born. And then we'll continue that on Thursday evening, the footsteps of Jesus. And then uh, you can pick up a flyer as you go out if you don't have one on Friday, next Friday, a week from tonight, we're gonna start uh, the series Tracing the Footsteps of Jesus. For that series, we actually uh, had seven one-month film trips over a four-year period, filming on location, researching on location, just for that series. Now, how many of you have been to Egypt? That's what we're talking about tonight. All right, a few of you. How many of you are going to Egypt? See, I got some friends here going with me in, in just about two and a half weeks. So, <laughs> the, uh, so I made my first trip to Egypt in 1986, and since that time, I've spent over four years in the Bible lands. And I got really excited about the Bible lands because it brings the Bible to life. So we're going to go to Egypt tonight, amazing discoveries in the land of the Nile. On the table, we have a lot of artifacts. And uh, we'll put out new artifacts every evening, let you get up close and look at them. We've got this nice bowl here I picked up at Bed Bath & Beyond in Chattanooga last night. Actually, this is from the time of Abraham. It's 4,000 years old. And uh, it it made it for 4,000 years and the TSA broke it a couple of years ago. So you can see the nice little break, but there's something called glue that put it back together. So anyway, uh, it's a nice little bowl. Isn't that lovely? Things haven't changed a lot. And uh, and then there's lamps here. So we have beautiful lamps. This is like a chandelier lamp. It's called a four wick lamp. These two pieces I just held up are from the time of Abraham. So we call them early Bronze Age. So around 2000 BC, 2200 BC in that range. And, uh, and then we have some other kinds of lamps that look more like seashells. And that's probably what they started out with. And so there's a whole evolution of lamps here on the table. And uh, as we come down, we uh, get a little closer to uh, lamps like this one. This is actually a nice Herodian lamp from the time of Jesus. It's my favorite lamp on the table. And some of them have markings on them and so on. These whole pieces we don't really find on archeological sites whole. They find them in tombs because they were put there by grave robbers. I'm sorry, they were found by grave robbers in tombs. People thought you might need a lamp in the afterlife, and so they put them in there. And uh, so some tombs might have hundreds of pieces of pottery in them. And so actually, down on this end of the table, things like this nice picture, these are all mostly from a place called Babidra. Bab is gate, gate of the arm. And many scholars believe that that is biblical Sodom. And uh, so anyway, they wasn't a big, big town, maybe a thousand people, but people got buried there. So they really found over 500,000 people being buried there. So just imagine all that, that's why this pottery is more abundant than this pottery. This piece is very rare here. This is from the time of Persia, the Persian period. And why would it be so rare? Maybe these young people can help me, any idea? So if you're looking for pottery in Israel or Judah, who's not living in Israel during the Persian period? Do you know? The Jews are in captivity in Babylon and then, and then in Persia. And so there's not very many people living there, so there's not much pottery from that period of time. So very rare. This is actually a filler that they would fill their lamps. So there's fillers up here that kind of match with the other, and uh, you can kind of check these things out at different times. This is a, we have three replicas on the table, and this is a scale model replica. It's a scale model of the Rosetta Stone. And the Rosetta Stone is interesting. It has three bands of writing on it. Now the original is four feet high. So this is like one foot. So it's four times this size. And we'll talk about that uh, this evening in the program and why it's so important. But it helped them to understand Egyptian writing uh, of the hieroglyphs and to be able to, tra- to uh, understand the hieroglyphs. So pottery will come out. Can you guess what period of time this is from, girls? Oh, it's a Christian time, right? You can see that very nice cross on it. So it's actually, we call it a Byzantine lamp, a Byzantine lamp, Byzantine Christianity. So um, sometimes they have little decorations like that. There's some up here with menorahs. And uh, again, we'll try and give you some new materials each evening uh, on the table to enjoy. I have to just tell you about one more since we're doing this. 
What do you think that is, guys? Any idea what that is? Ah, it's a tear bottle. That's right. So this is Roman glass, and the ancients would actually collect their tears. So if you made mom sad, she might cry and put it in and put a bottle, and then they say, well, it wasn't too bad today because there's just a few tears. <laughs> no. So they, people would actually collect their tears, and then under times of extreme emotion and sorrow, they'd pour out a lifetime of sorrow. And so we'll find next week, we'll tell a story about a lady who washed Jesus' feet with her she didn't have an onion under the table. She poured out a lifetime of sorrow from her tear bottle. Okay? And so we'll talk about some of those customs and things that help to bring the biblical stories to life. And uh, that's what we want to be focusing on. You folks see okay over there? There's a couple seats right in here on the front row. You good? Everybody's good? And um, so anyway, we have some brochures, as Pastor Fred said. Now, my wife tells me that I talk way too long. So uh, I've arranged for you to get a copy of tonight's presentation, and uh, you'll get the shorter version, hopefully, from me here. But uh, if you turn your card in for that, and then tomorrow evening, the plan is to take the names of those who turned them in tonight, and we're going to make a drawing, and somebody will win an artifact, a Roman-era lamp, okay? So make sure you turn your card in, all right? And, uh, and so we'll plan to share some of that. People seem to enjoy that from time to time. But tonight we want to go to Egypt and so amazing discoveries in the land of the Nile. When we think about Egypt, the very name stirs our minds with wonder. Pyramids, Sphinx, mummies, Tutankhamun. Egypt seems to hold a spell over our imagination. We wonder, what are the mysteries of its ancient buildings? they possess mystical powers? Why were they built and by whom? Egypt stirs our minds, as I said, and it takes me back to this quote from Herodotus, who wrote, Egypt has wonders more in number than any other land, and works it has to show beyond expression great. I made my first journey to Egypt in 1986, and like Herodotus and countless thousands before me, I was amazed at the wonders that I saw. And tonight I want to take you on a fascinating journey to this wonderful land of the pyramids. First, we want to begin in Cairo. Now, Cairo is over 17 million people. It's a crowded, dusty city, and yet it's one of the most vibrant cities in the world. It's filled with uh, monuments spanning nearly five millenniums of history from uh, Pharaonic in the old, old period to uh, Coptic and Muslim here and the more modern periods. It's a fabulous city, a wonderful city of contrast from the dry sands of the desert to the life-giving waters of the Nile, from the people who make their living collecting and sorting the garbage to the socially elite, Cairo is the very heartbeat of Egypt. Now, traveling is always an exciting experience in Cairo. You have a lot of different options. You can go on the metro, you can go on these antiquated streetcars, or you can go on the modern subways. You can take the dilapidated buses, or you can take the age-old felucas. You can take the speedy taxis, or you can go on the time-honored method of going by foot. Now, each outing, each outing can be an exciting and exhilarating experience, like the time I wandered into the Khan El Khalili Bazaar, where the famous Egyptian cotton fabrics were sold. It's a crowded marketplace, as you can see, and this truck got stuck and couldn't make the turn on a crowded, narrow street, so a group of men swarmed around and literally picked up the truck and pointed it in the desired direction. That's what they do here, right? Chattanooga, these Volkswagens are, anyway, uh, kind of interesting. This man had the fastest iron in the east. He ironed the galabia with his feet, he sprayed a mist of water from his mouth, and he folded it with his hands. And I have to say, my favorite leisure activity is strolling by the Nile in the cool of the evening. I love watching the sailors working their boats and seeing the city's skyline at night. And it seems to be a favorite of the locals, too, for the streets are always full of Cairoites enjoying their river in the cool of the day. Herodotus said, Egypt is the land of the Nile, and the Nile is the gift of the gods. This river has nourished Earth's longest civilization, and Egypt has always depended upon the Nile for its life, as we shall see. 99% of the people live on just 1% of the land, okay? It's called the 
and it's nourished by this river that flows from Central Africa, from the rainforest of Central Africa. It flows north, pushing through the searing sands of the Sahara Desert until it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. So let me think, we got some young people here. Any rivers around here in America that flow from south to north? There's one down in Florida, the St. John's. That's right. So the Nile also flows from south to north. So just imagine, it really doesn't rain. Where I took this picture, maybe every five years it rains. Okay? But it has a constant source of water from the rainforest of Central Africa. So it pushes through the searing sands of the Sahara Desert, as you can see right here. And uh, this, so it makes Egypt really like an island floating in the midst of the Sahara Desert. Its lengthy culture and history eternally linked to its geography. So it's bound by the Arabian Desert to the east and the Libyan Desert to the west and the Mediterranean Sea to the north and the great cataract at Aswan to the south. So it really only had one border to defend and that was protected by waterfalls or cataracts. And so because of that, ancient Egypt prospered. Now when you contrast that with the other great civilization of the past in Mesopotamia, and the problem in Mesopotamia was that um, there, were, there were no natural boundaries. So warring people might come out of the mountains, they come down and they attack you and they destroy your culture. Or somebody else in, in, in the floodplain comes down and, and, and destroys your culture. Here they were protected. And so they became upper and lower Egypt. Upper, by the way, Egypt is in the south because it's the upper part of the river. Get the point? Lower Egypt is in the north. So it's a little different than we might think in our world. So again, we can see that Egypt is always dependent upon it. It's one of the, it's really the richest farmland in the world. It's called Abyssinian carpet, the black land. And so this is the richest farmland in the world. It was so rich, by the way, the annual Nile flood would, would deposit a quarter of an inch of topsoil every year. So when the water would recede a quarter of an inch of topsoil, so it's just, you're not getting the problem with irrigation and everything becoming salty. And, and the water was so incredible that when the flood receded, they could plant their crops and they wouldn't have to irrigate for the whole growing season. Richest farmland in the world. And the Bible talks about that. So here we can see some of the ibis and so on that became a symbol of Egypt. So it's called the black land or Abyssinian carpet. And the Nile Valley is about one mile to 15 miles in width, depending on where it's at. And here you can kind of see the desert over here, quite wide. Here you can see it's very narrow. This is down in Aswan, and uh, the sand's pushing right in. So the line of demarcation is so forgiving, unforgiving and so distinct that you literally pass with one foot from the black land to the red land, from farmland to desert, and so that distinct. Now we go down to Aswan, and we can see that it was formed by this ridge of granite laying across the Nile River, and this created cataracts or waterfalls. And from this granite, here we can see the granite mines, they cut the, the granite that would be used in, in many, in the interior of the pyramids for sarcophagi, for obelisks, for monuments. And uh, we can see where they would just kind of chop, chop. Now here you can see some black diorite. They only have copper tools. Copper would never do anything with granite. They don't have iron yet. And so they would take this black granite, this black diorite, and they'd chip. Now last year, I hadn't been to Egypt for quite a while, and last year we were filming in Egypt, and uh, my wife was commensurating with me about the poor plight of the Hebrews, and we read about, I'm not trying to say it wasn't bad, but I just said, Helen, can you imagine being down here in Aswan, where it's about 120 in the shade, and there is no shade because there's no palm trees to speak of, and so you're down here and you're chipping granite, or would you rather be up on the Mediterranean in Goshen where there's palm trees and you got water to mix with mud and making mud bricks. And it's a tough life either way, but I don't want to be down here in the granite mines. I had my wife try and chip a little bit and she chipped for quite a while and got about two or three little specks out. But that's how they actually made their granite and their blocks. So they made these beautiful monuments and then they would ship them 500 miles downstream to Memphis. And that's what we see today uh, as they come down. So the Nile was perfect for river traffic. You could just imagine that the currents going from south to north, so it made you, you could just almost float downstream, and then the prevailing wind is coming from north and blowing south, and so you could sail back downstream. And so very important. So Aswan, 
very important. It's kind of the gateway into interior Africa, you might say. And in Aswan, they had built a dam in the 1920s, and they built the great Aswan High Dam. The Russians actually built this dam. And uh, you can kind of see it here, very, very uh, dramatic. And they formed a lake. It's called Lake Nasser, after the president, Nasser. Six miles wide, 310 miles long. And it flooded the land of Nubia, causing the Nubian villages to have to move up 212 feet to the banks above, and they also moved 14 temples and tombs. None of them was important as this tomb. It's called Abu Simbel, and uh, here was built by Ramses the Great. Now, he, Ramses had monuments to his glory from Lebanon to Africa, but this was the one that he built. It was his and his alone. And so they actually had to move this 212 feet from where it was, or it would be submerged and no one would see it. And so, indeed, they came up with a plan to cut it into over a thousand giant jigsaw pieces, saw it up, make a, a cliff molded to match the original, and then rebuilt it up on the top so today you can visit these incredible wonders of Ramses the Great. Now he had four statues, they're seated, 65 feet tall. How big are they? 65 feet. Now here, I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit. That's my wife Helen standing and she's not even coming up to his crown. So really, really big stuff, and that's why they called him the Great. So Aswan is really a little prosperous city. I love going there versus Cairo or Luxor because Aswan's more of a small city, but it's quite prosperous because of the dam and the industry it created, and you still see kind of Nubian life in an interesting way. So very nice little break going into Egypt. Now off the coast of Aswan, out in the river, I should say, there's an island about 100 yards, 200 yards out, it's called Elephantine Island because of this interesting little shape of a rock. You can't see it too well because of the boat there. And we go out there because there's a Nilometer. This is a temple. They had a, Ni a Nile temple. And this temple's interesting because you can kind of see where the water has been, see? Going up and down here. And so when you go down the stairs of the temple, you come down and you're able to see the markings. So the ancient Egyptians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and then the Arabs use these markings to predict the flood, how high the flood would be in the coming year. And they used these for thousands of years to predict how big the flood would be and how big the harvest would be. Now sometimes the flood's too big and that creates problems as well, and sometimes it's too little. So anyway, Aswan has this beautiful five-star hotel on the north end of the island, but you step across the little low wall and you go back into a Nubian village. And uh, back in the 1980s, I found these interesting people there and uh, they're doing their laundry of the washing machine out here and washing their dishes and so on. Probably not for the hotel, but no. Um, but I met a, an interesting school teacher, and, and, and the school teacher invited me to come to his home, and we gathered around, and the school teacher's wife was there, and she cooked our bread and heated our water for the tea on that interesting stove, and pretty soon her mom came, and her sisters came, and they all gathered around to sip tea and watch the daily soap opera. Some things don't change around the world. So I guess I said, you know, life has always dependent, been dependent upon the Nile. Here we can see down at Aswan with the Falukas, it's very popular to go. They sail one direction, they float the other, and it's almost effortless. That lady would say it wasn't effortless while her husband rides. But anyway, you can see that, that life depends upon the Nile River. And so while we can see this old waterway, and now they've got more of the, uh, the faster with the, electric, uh, the gasoline motors, but here I'm trying to show you that, that all of the water used in Egypt comes from the Nile River. Even the resorts on the Red Sea, and, and they have some of the finest scuba diving in the world, in places like Hergata, all their fresh water comes from the Nile, even though it has to be piped 150 miles across the desert because it never rains there, okay? So the Nile's so important. So today, the ageless Palooka is joined by the massive luxury ships plying the waters of this ancient land. Now, there are roads and train tracks paralleling the Nile, but the Nile is still the heartbeat and lifeblood of Egypt. Now, there's three remarkable things that stand out about ancient Egypt I want to share with you tonight. The first thing is that the dry climate preserves things. Now, I live not far from here for a period of time in my life, and we didn't have air conditioning where I lived, and uh, the books would, uh, would grow mold. Is it, did that happen? 
and, and people would get varnish and they'd varnish the books. I don't know, I guess that prevented the mold from, I don't know what it did, but they were varnishing the books because of the mold and the humidity. Here there is no humidity. It doesn't rain. So things made thousands of years ago survive down to modern times. The second thing is that the ancient Egyptians developed a complex method of writing, hieroglyphs, 2,500 characters in hieroglyphs. So you had to be a real scholar to write and read. Very, very tough. 2,500. But because of that, we can look back and understand what life was like at that time. And then the third point is that they portrayed life in their art. And since they believed that the afterlife was an extension of the present life, we can look into their tombs and we can see the paintings and carvings and we can see the models and we can understand what life was like at that time. And so very, very interesting. As I said, it's so dry that Upper Egypt especially is an archaeologist's paradise because it really, while it rains maybe once a year in Cairo, every four or five years down here in Luxor in Upper Egypt, and so it's made it really an archaeologist's paradise to go there. So you're familiar with the mummies, and so here we see a guy, and here we see a lady who received the perm 2,500 years ago, and she still sports it. And uh, so these mummies uh, also are very interesting, but did you know what this guy is? This guy, his name is Ginger because of his hair color. What's interesting about Ginger is he was never mummified. He was just buried in the sand over 4,000 years ago. His fingernails, toenails, hair still in place because he'd been naturally dehydrated and preserved for over 4,000 years. Now, what's interesting when we get into this is the Egyptians called, I'm just going to pause and move these flowers. Is that blocking your view? No? Is it blocking your view? No? Good? Okay. So the Egyptians called the tombs a house for eternity. And, and the Egyptian, you know, we have to understand their beliefs and if we want to understand why they do the things they do. And so they believed that, that after you die, your deified soul called the Ka, K-A, could get reconnected with you in the afterlife if it could recognize you. That was no problem if your name was Ginger, right? Because you just kind of you put you out in the sand and naturally. But then royalty and nobility said, we've got to have burial, better burials than that. And so they began digging deep pits down into the ground. And then they put, them in, they put the body into those deep pits, into the stone sarcophagi. And guess what happened? The bodies decayed. And that was a problem theologically because now the Ka couldn't reconnect with them. So they had to develop the practice we know today as mummification. As mummification. And so this whole idea develops. Now the word, word embalm comes from the Latin word. It means to put into aromatic resins to mask the odor of decomposition. And then the word mummy is actually an Arabic word that means bitumen or pitch. Now the Dead Sea was called the Sea of Asphalt because of all the bitumen that would float. And so they probably collected a lot of, of asphalt there and they would use that and they would coat the body with that to help preserve it into the afterlife even though it was in the damp thing. Now, Herodotus went to Egypt around 450 BC, and we don't really have any first-hand accounts, but, but he goes down and he tells us what they, they did. He said, they pulled the brain out through the nose by the means of an iron hook. So they kind of reached in and got the brain, pulled it out. And, uh, and then he tells us how they actually took the organs out, and so you'll find all of them have an incision usually on their right abdomen. They pulled the organs out, and they put them into these four jars, canopic jars. And so they would do this, and then they would pack the body with natron to dehydrate it, then they'd wrap it in linen, and then after 70 days, they would have a ceremony that would open the mouth. And so you can hear, you can see this is actually from King Tut's tomb. I took it there, and here's the priest. He's coming, he's got his leopard skin on, he's all in white because he's dead. He's coming to open the mouth of Tut so that he can be reconnected with his Ka after that 70 days. By the way, check it out. Jacob is also embalmed like this. Joseph is embalmed like this. Quite interesting. So the development of writing was important. Tourism has been going on in Egypt for over 4,000 years. And, uh, and again, they wrote down their achievements and what they did. And so we could read them. Now, when Herodotus went down, he could read them. But when Napoleon went down at the end of the 18th century, 
They had forgotten how to read this for nearly 2,000 years, and so they looked in wonder at these massive stone monuments. What could it mean? Napoleon was so moving in what he said, soldiers of France, 4,000 years of history look down upon you. The problem was they couldn't read any of that history. They looked in vain at these stone monuments that Herodotus understood. What did it mean? What were all these inscriptions about? They just could not understand at all. And so they were baffled. Well, Napoleon was more than just a soldier. So he brought a group of scholars down into Egypt, and, they, and yet they're just they're, they're stumped. They can't figure it out. What's going on? And uh, so many of these, here's some obelisks, just beautiful inscriptions, as you can see. And then the British were invading. Now, when the Nile flows from south to north, it branches. It used to have five branches that you could sail out to the sea on. Now there's two branches, and one branch called the Pelusiac branch, and one's called the Rashid branch, or Rosetta branch. And so there on the Rosetta branch that was going up, there was a fort. The British are coming. They're invading. And so they have a fort. Now, if you know there's going to be cannonballs coming, what would you do, guys? If you have a wall of your fort, what would you do? You'd want to put more stones behind the wall to make the wall thicker, right? So they're getting all the stones they can get in getting stones, everybody's coming, bringing stones, and one stone they get is this stone. It's black basalt, four foot high, two feet wide, and it's got three bands of writing on it. And they think, maybe it's important, so they put it on the side. Well, it turns out the top has hieroglyphs, and the middle has demotic, the coarse cursive form of hieroglyphs, and the bottom has Greek, and they're hoping that all three stories tell the same story. All three languages tell the same story. They don't know. So they put it on the side. They make squeegees of this and send it out through the scholarly world. And this man, 24 years later, Jean-Francois Campolian, breaks the code of pharaonic writing. And for the first time in a couple thousand years, we can read hieroglyphs again. Now, today, this stone is in the British Museum. So let me ask you this question. Who won the naval battle? <laughs> the British, that's right, it's in their museum, isn't it? So now they could really begin to read all these monuments and, and they could understand what's going on. And so Egypt, ancient Egypt began to open its wonders. Now here is a fascinating building. It's uh, the first large scale stone building built on the planet. It's uh, called the Step Pyramid. You can see the steps. There's actually six different steps. So in the ancient times, they would, they would dig down, they'd put somebody in the ground, and, and you know what would happen? Dogs, jackals would come and dig them up, right? Pretty bad deal. So then they would put like one slab on top of it so the jackals couldn't go down. So King Zosier and his architect Imhotep, they began to think, well, what can we do? So they wanted to put one slab, we'll put six slabs. And so this is the first pyramid that we think about. Now, less than 200 years later, they began to work on the biggest stone buildings built ever built. Now, all these pharaohs were, let me just jump back here. It's not gonna jump back. All these pharaohs are gonna be built during this period of time for a thousand years under or in a pyramid. Sometimes they're out of mud brick and sometimes they're, they're small and sometimes they're irregular. And then work began on this building. This is a great pyramid of Cheops, 2,300,000 blocks weighing on average two and a half tons each. Now inside of this is a sarcophagus and all this granite that was floated down from Aswan, and it's more like 60 tons, okay? So big, big stuff. And so here we can see this fantastic building. So this is the, really the first great big pyramid, you might say. His dad did a pyramid called the Red Pyramid and the Bent Pyramid, but uh, che Cheops does this, and uh, it's fantastic. This pyramid is 480 feet high. 755 feet on each side. Now, no four sides equal each other, but the difference between the longest side and the shortest side is eight inches. So almost perfect right angles, amazing. They built it above the flood plain so it wouldn't flood up in here. They took a lot of the blocks out. They cut out the limestone here to use it here. And uh, so this was uh, a gigantic engineering leap. But you can imagine, it took a lot of money to build all of that a lot of effort and energy, and they drain the resources of the country. So people look at this and they think, wow, how did they build that? Herodotus actually said that they had advanced 
technologies that they had to block and tackle. Now we know they don't have the block and tackle. He said they had iron tools. We know they didn't have iron tools. They had bronze tools. Herodotus said it took 100,000 slaves 30 years to build the Pyramid of Cheops. Now they only worked during the time of the flood because they couldn't do their farms. And so it took a lot of long time to do it. So people wonder, how could they be built? Was there occult sciences going on here? Was there help from outer space? You know, we hear that some people even believe the pyramids are, are a prophecy of the world in the, predicting the future and so on. We hear all kinds of wild ideas and theories. Actually, the pyramids could have been built with the simplest of tools. The Egyptians were used to leveling their fields with using water and uh, they had lots of work workers and they did not have something called OSHA, right? So it didn't matter if people got hurt along the way, you just, they were expendable and that's what happened. By the way, the Hebrews are not in Egypt at this point. Hebrews have nothing to do with building these pyramids, okay? Different period of time. So when we look off in the distance, we can see here's the pyramid of Cheops and here's his son Kephron. Kephron's pyramid looks to be taller, but it's not because really it's on higher ground. But we can see that it still has that that uh, beautiful cap on it, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. And so here you can see the cap. Originally, the pyramids were all out of that fine white Turo limestone, but they got recycled into other things. So why would Herodotus give us all this false information? I want you to think about this. Herodotus went down in 450 BC, and the pyramids were further away from his day than the Colosseum in Rome is from us in our day. Okay, get your mind around that, they're old really old. And so he got there and he mistook these guides for knowledgeable people. This guide I met one night and uh, he said, you know, there's a meditation room inside the Sphinx. I'll take you there in the morning. Just give me a $50 deposit tonight. <laughs> you don't know, you're right? We're skeptical. <laughs> I had my $50, by the way. I didn't, I knew enough not to do that. The Sphinx seems to symbolize all that's strange and mystical and wonderful about ancient Egypt. It fused together the features of lion and king and man. It's 240 feet long and 66 feet high and 13 foot uh, face wide. And, and it's just fascinating. A lot of these pictures I shot years ago and you can see they were actually rebuilding and it's all kind of redone. The scaffolding is gone now. Here's actually Kephron's pyramid, the little limestone, the white Tura limestone on the cap here. This is actually a portrait of the man who re was residing inside. Actually a portrait of Kephron in front of it. And so it was a beautiful monument, very striking, and kind of the symbol of Egypt, you might say. Now this Sphinx is very interesting because there was a stele found between the paws of the Sphinx. And many scholars uh, pondered, could this be? The stele talks about how there was a guy, a prince who was out riding, his name became Tutmosis IV, and he was riding and, and he paused, he was hunting, he paused to take a nap. And while he was napping, the Sphinx spoke to him and said, hey, sand's all over me, clean me out and I'll make you Pharaoh. And guess what? Even though he's not the oldest guy in the family, he became Pharaoh. So many people think that maybe he was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And so this steely between the paws tells the story. So I went out at 4.30 in the morning, when you could get down into this, and I thought I got there before the tourists got there, and I got these pictures because it tells a fascinating story. Here's what it says. On one such day it so happened that the king's son Tutmosis had come hunting at noon, and afterwards resting in the shadow of this great god, sleep seized him, and he found the majestic deity speaking to him as a father speaks to his child. Look at me, Tutmosis, my son. I am your father, Horus and the horizon. I promise what is my gift, earthly rule at the head of all the living. Seated on the throne of the earth god, you will wear the white crown and the red crown. All the territory in which the eye of the sun rests will be yours. Yours the food of the two lands. Great tribute and long life. I, to you I turn my face and heart for protection since I am sick in all my limbs. The sands of this holy place upon which I rest have covered me. And guess what? He cleans the sand and he becomes Pharaoh, even though he's not the oldest son. And at that point in time, this was already a thousand years old, and that was in the 15th century BC. So really old stuff, really old stuff. And so we look and we think about why they built these pyramids. 
these incredible expenditures of, of time and energy and money because they were really houses for eternity. Inside is where they would be buried. And so we see their burial practices. This is actually a picture I took when you could take it of King Tut's tomb. He's inside of this. They moved most of the artifacts to the Cairo, and, and now they have a new museum opening out in Giza where they're going to display them. But they actually left his mummy in that particular tomb, King Tut's tomb. So as soon as a Pharaoh came to power, he began building his pyramids. They, they evolved from those slabs on the ground to the big stone buildings. They're all built on the west side of the Nile. They go down to Luxor. They're all putting them in the west side of the Nile. So death is a very static world. You live on the east side. You bury the dead on the west side. Sun rises in the east, sets in the west, and you're going to be like the sun. You're going to come up in the morning. And so this is a belief. They have belief in immortality. But these giant mausoleums screamed out, wealth is inside, money's inside. And so they robbed all the pyramids. And so they went down to the Luxor and they began burying over in Thebes. They began tunneling down into the ground. And yet there's just too much wealth there. And so the workers would just tell somebody and they'd, they'd, they'd steal all the treasures. There's only one treasure that's come down intact from that time. And you know him as King Tut or Tutankhamun. And so here we, again we can see him and the depictions in his tomb. But before we look at that fascinating story, let's pause and think about the biblical stories. Where do they fit? Was Joseph really real, or is that just a Jewish myth? What would we think? Well, you remember the story of Joseph? Joseph is a Semite. That means he, he, he's Semitic in his derivation. He goes down to Egypt. They're Hamites. He goes down into Egypt, and while he's there, he gets put in jail. And while he's in jail, he hears about Pharaoh having some dreams. Remember that? And, and remember he dreams about seven fat cows followed by seven thin cows coming out of the Nile River? And so the Bible's very interesting. It says, God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming through the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance of Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. Pharaoh listens to this. He thinks this is dangerous. He knows how in the past there have been great collapses of culture because of famine. And so he listens to what Joseph says. Joseph says, let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the company to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. Let me just tell you, there are a lot of famines in Egypt. There are a lot of famines in the past. They had the advantage. What was their advantage? The water came from the rainforest of Africa and flowed north. You get to a place like Canaan, and guess what happens? That's why the family of Joseph goes down into Egypt. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck, and he had him ride in a chariot as a second in command. Here we see a fascinating tomb painting from a place called Beni Hassan down in Armana. And what's interesting is these are not Egyptians. These people are Semites. They're like from Canaan. Egyptians, they not, they're not into animals. They're not into taking care of animals. You know, you do shepherds when you can't grow food. And so shepherds kind of wander around. Abraham's a shepherd, and if I'm going to be real honest, he's not in the best part of the, of the country. He's in really rocky, scant growing area. It's not like Tennessee. You know, it's he's, he's, he's really rough. Here we see these guys coming down. They're coming out of Canaan, probably during a famine. At the time of Joseph. Now, this is not Joseph or Jacob and his family, but it sheds a light on the story and lets us know. This guy was an official, and, and he was recording people coming down and how these people were coming, escaping famine. So the Egyptians kind of had an immigration system, you might say, they were working on. So we wonder, is the story of Joseph a myth? Well, down in Aswan, they found a very interesting inscription. I collected corn, I was watchful in time of sowing, and when famine arose lasting many years, I distributed corn. The Nile is not overflowed for a period of seven years. Herbage fails, the storehouses were built, all that was in them has been consumed. Interesting. Now, again, I'm not saying this is the story of Joseph, but it parallels the story of Joseph. Many famines came. So what's interesting is when you take the biblical chronology of the world of Joseph, 
he would come to power during a guy named Sunneseret II, 12th dynasty of Egypt. Now, I just ran across this. We were filming last fall in Egypt, and I had been to Egypt since 2000, and was filming on, and studying about Joseph, and I said, wow, this is fascinating. When you come back to this period, and I went out to this pyramid, because here's the pyramid of Sennacherib II. And I say, oh, that doesn't look too good. A bunch of, a bunch of, a bunch of stones. Most likely, Joseph buried his pharaoh in this pyramid. Okay? Now, if you're, his, he initiates what's called the Middle Kingdom. So you have the Old Kingdom, then they have the First Intermediate Period, and then you have the Middle Kingdom, and then you have the Hyksos Period. And here we can kind of see mud bricks. And then you can see this Tura limestone. It used to be all covered by Tura limestone, but they recycled it after he died into other things. Look at that mud brick, by the way. Can you see the mud? Look at that the straw. Makes you think about the story of the Hebrews. Now, the Hebrews aren't here. They're somewhere else, but they're using mud bricks a lot. Now, I want to show you this fascinating picture. Here's the Nile. It's pushing up, coming from 4,000 miles long, coming out of Central Africa, pushing north, north. You see the Green Valley here? That's what we talk about, the Nile Valley, 1 to 15 miles. And then it goes into what's called the delta. So it's, it looks like a lotus flower coming up, boom, boom. Today there's only two branches. There used to be five branches. And then you can see these lakes out here. Not natural lakes. Not natural. Depressions. 200 feet deep. I'm sorry, 200 feet below sea level. Guess what Sunesser II does? He takes and builds canals and takes the water from the Nile and fills those depressions, and he adds one-third more land that can now be cultivated by Egyptians. So if you know that you're, you're, you're in this whole thing of famine and feast and famine, what would you do? You want to be able to irrigate more land. And that's what Joseph does with Sunesser II. And what was fascinating, where I'm standing here, you can see that same pyramid we're talking about. You know what that waterway is called today? Joseph's Canal. Wow. And so it almost makes, you know, you feel funny. Right? Joseph's Canal. Now, there was a dry period around 300 B.C., and, they, and this all dried up. And then a British engineer found it at the end of the 19th century. And he said, you know, we could put a lot more land. You know, here are these dikes and canals. And lo and behold, in the middle of the 20th century, they flooded the land again. And there's a huge, called the Fayum. Fayum, you can read about it today, the oasis out there, but it actually was coming from the Nile. So this would be the Pharaoh of the time of Joseph. If we're tracking the biblical history, this is where it would be, and it dovetails perfectly. Now, I took this picture down at Tanis. So I was trying to get to Avaris, and when I go to those sites, it's quite comfortable to go to Egypt today. When you travel in Egypt, you know, if you're an American group, you know, they, you've got, you know, your, your Magnum PI guy with you, you know, he's kind of a handsome Egyptian guy who's wearing a suit, usually with a big gun. And in his back, behind him, is a little machine gun. To, the only thing that happened to Americans is my point. When I go up to this area, I've got uh, two police vehicles with masked <laughs> policemen. You know, it, it wasn't very good for filming, let's put it that way. And so I had about 10 or 12 policemen, and they're all masked up and so on. This is Tanis. This is, a, this is the capital for Ramses the Great. This is the capital for the, somebody asked me about Shishank, and th these, these guys are from here. But it doesn't look like much of a palace. Do you know why? It's all mud brick. Now, if you want to have your palace down by the Nile in the dry season, what happens in the wet season? It goes underwater. It floods. And so constantly, they've got to be replenishing these bricks. The only thing that survives is the granite, and even it takes a beating, as you can see. So here we see these granite stones. So here we see our mud bricks. So this is the area of Goshen. This is where the Hebrews are living. This is why they're being employed to manufacture bricks. And so they've now got to get their own straw. You can see the straw in there. You see it? And so they've got to stamp those bricks out because there's a constant need because the flood's coming and knocking out their palaces. And so another development happens just after this. It's called the Hyksos. These people come from Canaan. There's a Dead Sea and kind of come down across. And here's this barrier. They come down in Egypt, and they're, they're called the foreign chieftains. And so they come down, they were doing business down there in the, in the delta, and now all of a sudden at this place called Avaris, they take over and they rule as Pharaoh, even though they're not Egyptian. 
Now the people down in the rest of Egypt hate it, but, but they're strong because they've got a chariot and they've got bows, double bows, they've got advanced weaponry. And so the people down in the south, they try and, and overcome. And, and so this guy's second in Ray, he's a prince from down in Thebes. And so what he wants to do is overthrow them. And so he fights against them. And guess what happens to him? Can you see? Can you see his mummy there? Look at that. You know what that is? <sighs> Axes. Yeah. Boom, boom. His sons, Kamosis and Amosis, continue the struggle and they drive out the Hyksos, the Semitic overlords. They drive them away and they found the powerful 18th dynasty of the New Kingdom. And this ushers in the greatest period of Egyptian history. Fascinating what happens. And so they actually say that they make Semites their slaves. Now earlier, there's probably another king who doesn't know Joseph, and so they're, they're in trouble before the Hyksos come. And, uh, but we ponder this question that's raised in the Bible. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said, come let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply. And in the event of war, they also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us. So they applied taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And so it makes perfect sense. While Joseph is there, time passes and all of a sudden someone else comes to power who doesn't know Joseph. And now there's a problem. They begin to, to mistreat them and they lose their privileges. They've sided with the old regime. We see this constantly in places like Iraq. If you're in with Saddam Hussein, you're out now, right? Back and forth. And so they do that. And then as the Hyksos comes, this puts it on steroids. And so it's during this time of the oppression of the Hebrews comes to its head. Tutmosis makes a decree to have all these babies killed. These rulers found Luxor and the south and Thebes, and they bring them to their highest power. This is the statues of Ramses, these incredible statues. They um, look like they were poured from the same mold. There's four of them, two seated and four standing, six of them actually. We see these obelisks here that are so stunning. And uh, one stands in Luxor Temple, the other stands in Paris today. And so they, they, they established their capital down in Thebes. Here we can see this papyrus and the lotus flower. And, and these temples are just stunning, beautiful Luxor temples, special. But I want to take you down to Karnak Temple in Luxor. This is the world's largest temple. You can see the Avenue of the Sphinxes here. The Avenue of the Sphinxes are interesting because these Sphinxes run all the way down to the river. Then they run a mile and a half up the river to Luxor Temple. And you can just imagine walking in and being impressed by that. You come into the, the main hall, the Hippisto Hall, and these columns here have capitals that are large enough for 100 people to stand upon. And yet today, they still carry seven-ton beams on top of them. So it's phenomenal, 3,500 years old, still carrying that. By the Sacred Lake, I photographed this very interesting scarab beetle. Of all the animals, the Egyptians focused on the scarab beetle, or the dung beetle, I should say. The dung beetle would, would bury its larvae in dung. You know what that is, right? Yeah, yeah. in dung, and then they'd roll it. And in the morning, guess what would happen? It'd come out of the dung. And they thought, ah, oh, resurrection, new life. So the Egyptians tended to focus on the beetle. They'd wear them on their rings and they'd put them on their hearts and death and so on because they too wanted to be coming out of the dung, as it were, in the morning. Now here we can see these beautiful columns, this papyrus and the lotus flower still retaining some of its color after 3,500 years. But I was really, I'm always drawn to this obelisk here. It's the obelisk of the mystery woman of ancient Egypt, Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut was royal, but uh, she decides to not be a co-ruler, but she was Egypt's first female ruler. And she will become Pharaoh and rule for over 20 years. She'll wear the ceremonial beard. Here we can see her and her father's obelisk. Her obelisk, hers is actually taller than her father's. Her father was interesting. It was Tutmosis I. She marries his son through a concubine, Tutmos is a second. She builds this beautiful temple for her, for her funeral procession. It's called our mortuary temple. It's my favorite temple in Egypt. It's called Deir el Bari. And although she built this for her funeral, 
When they found all the mummies from this period of time, they could not find hers. And then we see that all of the inscriptions about her were chiseled out. See that? Defaced. Why? What was going on? Well, as I said, her father was Tutmosis I, probably the one who made the decree to kill the Hebrew babies. He only has a daughter, had Shapsut through the royal wife, but he's got other wives, and so he has a son who becomes Tutmosis II, so she marries her stepbrother. They don't have any sons. They have a daughter, apparently, but no sons. And so he dies, but guess what? He's got other wives, and so he has some kids from, the, from that. And so when he dies, the priests surround, and they make his son, his, her stepson, nephew, Pharaoh Tutmosis III. So they co-rule together for five, six, seven years, but she gets tired of it, and she pushes him to the side, and she becomes Pharaoh over 20 years. She rules as Pharaoh for over 20 years. And then something happens and she passes from the annals of history. All of her monuments are effaced. Her mummy is missing. Why the mystery? Here we can again see her father, Tutmosis I, had Shapsut, but notice this building around it. Once she's deposed, her stepson, nephew, could not bring down that obelisk. It is so tall, it would have destroyed the whole temple. So you know what he did? Can you see it? He actually built a building around it. And this building went up, and you can actually see, see the shade, shading here? The shading was so great, it was protected from the sun so that nobody in the temple could see her obelisk. He hated her for what she did. Although she was made this beautiful mortuary temple for her death, they could not find her mummy with the other mummies from that dynasty. The worst thing you could do was not to kill your enemy. The worst thing you could do was to destroy their mummy so they'd have to wander aimlessly throughout the past. Now the Bible verse, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, puts it into focus. In the 480th year, after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, he began to build the temple of the Lord. There you have a timeline, if you believe the Bible, Chronology, you got a timeline, right? So it says it's, it's a 480th year after the Israelites, fourth year. So we know that the Temple of Solomon is going to be built 480 years before the Temple. The Exodus is 480 years before the Temple. The temple's built in 970, takes us to 1450 BC. Noah, Moses is about 40 years old, so takes us right to the time of Tutmosis I. Tutmosis I is the one who makes the decree to kill the Hebrew babies. They're getting too much up there in this place called Avaris. This is where the Hyksos did their coup against the Egyptians, and so they're very nervous. Got to kill all these Egyptian babies as they're born. Throw them in the Nile, kill them. And so Amram and Jochebed have the baby, and you know the story, they can't bear to kill him, and so they fulfill the letter of the law. They don't just throw him into the river to drown. They put him in a basket, float it, put it over where Princess Hat Shapsut is known to come. She sees the baby, she reads it in a glance, she hears it crying, she thinks it's a gift from the gods, specifically from Hopi, the Nile god, and she takes the baby. Miriam, remember there? Miriam, can we get a nurse? Can I get a nurse? And God works it out for Moses to grow up for several years with his mother and birth father. He learns about the monotheistic God. Now it's very interesting, Moses means born of or drawn from. So we have many names. Remember we talked about second and raised children? Ah, Moses. Born of the moon god Ah. Ka Moses, born of the deified soul Ka. Tut Moses, born of the scribal god Tut. And then we have Ra Moses, born of the sun god Ra. You call him Ramses. So probably his name was Hapi Moses, born of the Nile god Hapi. And he probably dropped that reference to the Egyptian deity when he left Egypt. And so God worked it out for Moses, lived with his mom and his dad learn about the monotheistic God, Yahweh. And then when he became of age, 40 years of age, remember the story, he saw them mistreating the Hebrews, comes to an awareness of who he is, kills the Egyptian, and he has to flee and run away. And he runs out into the Egypt. He runs out into the desert. And Tutmosis, his stepbrother, kills his stepmother, at Chapsut, goes through, chisels out her references all through Egypt, and 
takes the crown on his himself. 27 times he invades Palestine and Syria, almost every year of his reign. He says that he has Semitic slaves in his employ. He tries to efface all references to Hatshepsut, his stepmother and Moses' stepmother. And then the Bible says that Moses is brought back from the land of Midian and he confronts his stepbrother, Tutmosis III. And this is what the Bible says, Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Can you hear between the lines? Brother Moses, you had your chance. You could have been the ruler of the whole thing, and you chose not to. You chose to go with those Hebrews. Now I'm the ruler of the whole thing. I don't know your God, and I'm not going to let your people go. Now, it's interesting. Egyptologists tell us he died March 17, 1450. Okay? So they say he's at least 60 years old. Now, they found all the mummies except for Hatshepsut from this whole dynasty. They were all hidden in a place up in the caves. We know he's 60 years old when he dies, but guess what? When they x-rayed the mummies, they found a mummy that was 40 years old. What? Now, it's interesting, what time of year is Passover? The spring. So let's just assume that he's the guy who chases them out into the desert and he drowns in the sea. And you can't find the body. What do you do if you're the soldiers? <laughs> you get somebody, right? You can't find his body, you get somebody. And so they bring back a younger body, 20 years younger to be specific. And they embalm that body, and they do the 70 days, and all of that, and nobody is the wiser until they x-ray the mummies and find that, that it's masquerading, a younger person masquerading as Tutmosis III. And so it appears that this would be the fear of the Exodus. Now, this is a fascinating window. I don't know if I dare say this. I know I'm in the South. I took this picture in Richmond, Virginia, at a church. It happens to be the church where Robert E. Lee went to church. And if you look at Moses very carefully, you'll see that Moses is Robert E. Lee. Okay? But it's the most beautiful window I know of this story and the most beautiful painting I know, so we're going to use it here. And we're going to bring up the beautiful quote from Hebrews 11. When Moses had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Messiah as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. And we say, huh? What? When Moses grew up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why? He wanted a better reward. What? If he would have been a humble and pliable student, just think of the burial, the reward he would have. Look at that. Wouldn't you love to have a, a portrait like that? There we have the death mask of King Tutankhamun. Wouldn't you love to have a coffin like that? He wants a greater reward than that? Yes, a greater reward. You see, he realized that Egypt was just a death cult. As soon as you came to power, you began planning for your death. And so whether it was building a pyramid or tunneling into the West Bank at Thebes, it was just a death cult, invented and perpetuated by the priests to ensure their power and control over Egypt. And so we go down to Luxor and across the river to Thebes, and there we see the Valley of the Kings. And we find these just dozens and dozens and dozens of tombs that are down into the caverns. All of them had been raided. And in 1922, Howard Carter was digging, and he was kind of almost ready to give up. And eight days into the dig, he found a door that had not been breached. Huh. So he had to wait, and he had to send word to England, to Lord Carnarvon, come quickly. So they wait, they prepare, they've got to wait for the benefactor to come from England, and they get there. And Carter now opens the tomb for the first time since it was shut after the grave robbers came in. This is what he writes in his diary. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner, darkness and blank space as far as an iron testing rod could reach. Candle tests were applied as a precaution against possible foul gases, and then widening the hole a little, I inserted the candle and peered in. Lord Carnarvon standing anxiously beside me to hear the verdict. At first I could see nothing, the hot air escaping from the chamber causing the, the candle flame to flicker. But presently as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room would then emerge slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold. 
everywhere the glint of gold. For the moment, an eternity it must have seemed to the other standing by, I was struck dumb with amazement. And when Lord Carnarvon, unable to stand the suspense any longer, inquired anxiously, can you see anything? It was all I could do to get out the words. Yes, wonderful things. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Can you imagine when he looked in, he saw the antechamber that had been entered by thieves and then left in disarray, and then the whole tomb had been resealed. It was just kind of all jumbled together. But then as they, they went further in, they found rooms that had not been opened since the death of the boy, boy king who died under mysterious circumstances at the age of 17. They saw these, this is a reproduction here, but they saw these uh, the beds, these fabulous gold-covered beds. And uh, here is actually the original that they found. Uh, you can see the symbol of, of rebirth, the bitumen, the black on it, the gold. Everything spelling out the hope that Tut would live again and be there in the afterlife. Phenomenal. Then they, of course, found the beautiful 296-pound gold death mask bearing the features of the boy king, as I said, who died under mysterious circumstances. His beard here showing him as being one with Osiris, the god of the dead. Everything spelling out the hope he would live in the afterlife. Look at this beautiful throne chair, this gold and silver and the, and the uh, lapis lazuli. Here's an interesting, another throne that he had. I like this one because of the footstool. Can you see the footstool? Guess what's in the footstool? Let me see if I can bring this slide up. Sorry, it's not as clear as it could be. These are the Asiatics and these are the Nubians. The Africans on one side and the others. So you remember what the Bible says in Psalms? Sit down on your throne and I will make your enemies a footstool under your feet. So every time he sat down, he put his feet on the throats of his enemies. Check out the cane. Asiatics over here, the white guy. Nubians over here, the black guy. I've got all my enemies by the throat, as it were, whenever I walk, right? I can deliver you. So everything in the tomb showing us power. There's a nest of seven coffins. They opened the coffins one after the other, and it was just remarkable what they found until they come down to the beautiful gold death mask that we're all just a symbol of Egypt for us today, isn't it? And so we see Moses turned away from a funeral like that. He could have had all of this, but he chose to disregard that, this tremendous chest here and these canopic jars and the jewelry and we, we go on and on and we see the scarab here, there's a beetle go around your neck because you're going to live in the afterlife. Gold daggers, just exquisite, over 5,000 priceless objects of art were found there in the tomb of King Tut. Fingernails, toenails, the coverings out of gold to, uh, in case something happened, very uncomfortable pillow, but look at that, isn't that gorgeous? That's actually a pillow that propped their heads up and so on. I buried, here's the canopic jars with the or organs in them, these beautiful alabaster jars. Exquisite, wonderful. And yet Moses turned away from that. Moses turned away from that because he knew it was not true. The Egyptian belief in the Ka and the Ba, he knew was just a fairy tale. He had learned about the true monotheistic God at his mother's knee. And so he chose to turn away from the treasures of Egypt, the rewards of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to a better reward, a better reward. And it reminds me of the words of the psalmist who wrote this, do not be overawed when a man grows rich, when the splendor of his house increases, or he will take nothing with him when he dies. He goes on to say, though while he lived, he counted himself blessed, he will join the generation of his fathers who will never see the light of life. For all can see that wise men die and leave their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever. But God will redeem my life from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this evening for a time to drift away to a faraway land and distant time and place and find ourselves there in Egypt. We find ourselves pondering, amazed at the choice Moses makes. What choice would we make? Wow, he saw something so important that he thought it was worth turning away from the treasures of Egypt to follow you. From our perspective, we think he made the right choice. Help us to make choices like that that will honor you and will bless others around us like Moses did long ago, is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Now this is actually Howard Carter found when he opened the tomb. He didn't see all the, I mean the gold is there, but actually the flowers had been laid there 
And so here was the dehydrated flowers, you might say, after all those years. Tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening, fabulous tales of telltales. We'll go to Petra, we'll go to many other sites. And after telling the story of Petra, we'll look at how biblical stories can be affirmed through archaeology. I think you'll enjoy this one very much. And uh, then on Monday, the Jew, the Arab, and Jerusalem. And uh, so we hope you can join us for these presentations. And remember, turn your card in when you go out, and they'll give you a copy of tonight's presentation. So all those things we talked about should be in there. You can enjoy that. Come up if you'd like to see the artifacts. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening. God bless.